Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm so pleased that you could join us for this afternoon's discussion of uh, Moore's Law. I could spend the entire hour, I think, uh, recounting the accomplishments of the two individuals I'm so pleased to share this stage with, but I will be brief. Um, William Davidow is an accomplished electrical engineer, having pursued its study at Dartmouth, Caltech, and Stanford. Following a stint in the computer industry, he joined Intel in the 1970s, where he made key contributions to its microprocessor activity. In the 1980s, he co-founded Moore Davidow Ventures, a successful venture capital firm. Along the way, he's authored a number of notable books, including his most recent, Overconnected. Carver Mead is himself a most accomplished electrical engineer, a pioneering contributor to semiconductor electronics and microelectronics. Following his study of electrical engineering at Caltech, he had the good fortune to join its faculty, um, making this his home base for his career. Carver's own contributions in device innovation, VLSI design, and neuromorphic approaches are perhaps matched by the creative and entrepreneurial efforts of his former students. Uh, for the benefit of those in the audience who are just joining us, I'll provide a very brief survey of Moore's Law and its ramifications today before we turn to Bill and Carver's thoughts on how we might think about Moore's Law and its lessons. Uh, at the end of the session, We'll take your questions if you'd like to jot them down on the uh, cards provided, and they'll be f collected from you as we go along. So, I have a few slides for my review. What was Gordon Moore thinking about and steeped in by 1965? The chemical printing technology for manufacturing transistors and from about 1961, integrated circuits or microchips. This is a photograph of uh, part of a um, semiconductor manufacturing operation showing, showing the, um, some of the chemical operations going on, diffusion, etching, cleaning. What did Gordon see? He saw that at his firm, Fairchild and others, they were pushing chemical printing to fashion smaller transistors and to put more of them into microchips. In fact, the complexity was doubling every year. And what was the cause? Gordon reasoned that competitive advantage was found in the cutthroat business of microchips by finding an optimum complexity where performance advantage was met with the lowest cost. By increasing complexity through transistor miniaturization, microchips made digital electronics both better and profoundly cheaper. To illustrate these fundamentals, Moore made his now famous prediction of annual doubling in an article published 50 years ago this weekend. These fundamentals and the resulting regular doublings of microchip complexity have continued to the present. The cost of electronics has fallen over a billion fold, while silicon transistors on microchips have become the object most made by humankind. With this proliferation of electronics, we've fashioned a new layer of reality, electronic reality, which now consumes the majority of the waking lives of hundreds of millions of people. The microchip development has reshaped the nature of computing, as noted by Gordon Bell. Today, the dominant form of computer is not the mainframe or even the PC, but is the smartphone, the supercomputer in your pocket. Sales of smartphones connected pocket computers, if you will, now vastly outpace those of PCs. Today, about three billion people are connected to the internet, the majority through their smartphones. Many projections hold that another billion 
will come online in just five years, all via smartphones. And today, about half of the world's literate adults have smartphones, with projections that by 2020, nearly all literate adults will have one. With all of these computers and their connectivity, electronic reality is both spreading and deepening, with an order of magnitude increase in, the digital, in digital information in just this decade. So with that as a quick sketch of uh, what Gordon Moore observed um, and described as Moore's Law and where it's brought us to the present, I'd like to turn to you, Bill, uh, for your thoughts about um, connectivity, change, and how we should think about it. Well, I thought I'd start off with a, talking about a lecture <clears throat> I attended probably in 1960 when I was a graduate student at Stanford. And it was given by Richard Hamming, who uh, headed computation at Bell Labs at that time. And he wanted to talk about order of magnitude advances in technology. And his point was that every time an important technology makes an order of magnitude advances, advance, it has tremendous social implications. And this was before Moore's Law, and Hamming <clears throat> used the example of transportation. And so what he pointed out is when we went from the horse, uh, who traveled at three to six miles an hour, to the railroad, which went 30 to 60 miles an hour, <clears throat> we changed the structure of society. Uh, <clears throat> it had all kinds of effects. Uh, the horse enabled us to create the city-state, where we brought good, goods and fuel into cities. They could not have existed without that advance in transportation. The railroad, on the other hand, created the industrial city. And with it was a totally different social structure that went along with it. The suburbs were located along the railroad tracks. Then along came the automobile, and it created the two-dimensional structure that we have in society today, where things didn't have to be located linearly. So there was another transformation that occurred. And then Hamming went on to discuss the effects of the airplane. I have often wondered what Hamming would think about if you think that the railroad was maybe something that happened uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years after the horse. <clears throat> and the airplane happened 100 to 200 years after the train. Those were order of magnitude advances over millennium and hundreds of years. I've often wondered what Hamming would say about an eight order of magnitude advance in 50 years, which is what Moore's Law is about. And so to me, one of the fascinating things about Moore's Law is where we may talk about smartphones and things like that, it's to talk about the social and economic transformations that are going to happen as a result of it. One of these things that you can think about is that in the 20th century, moving information was extremely expensive and slow. And so what we did was we moved people to the information. Think of Walmart as a massive filing cabinet <laughs> where you go to learn about what's available and what its price is and <clears throat> whether it will fit you. And then think about Amazon. What we have done is gone from moving people to the information to moving information to the people, and we've created a new structure of society. Retailing in the future may look like a giant warehouse with an automated vehicle that will deliver things to you. Think of UPS, not drones, automated UPS. Similarly, work is another situation uh, where you think of the office building, it is a giant physical filing cabinet and a communication network. Suddenly, you no longer have to go to the office, and I've computed that the average office worker spends the amount of time and equivalent cost in getting to the office of about 25% of his salary. Suddenly, it becomes possible for that person to work at home. So I think it's really interesting to think about how society might look in 50 or 100 years, because the way society will work and look is a reflection of the way we interconnect. And I suspect 
that the job creation in the future is going to be the, actually the construction industry, where we end up rebuilding all the physical infrastructure in society as a result of Moore's Law. Hmm, that's fascinating. I, I, the, the idea that society is a reflection of its interconnection. Um, I was fascinated reading your book, uh, Overconnected, uh, with uh, many of the illustrations that you brought up that of positive feedback loops that are um, that can be at play in highly connected systems. And uh, it seems that uh, with the development of silicon microelectronics, the convergence of computing and communication, the interconnectivity of the internet, we're in a highly connected state. So I wonder if you could speak to that issue of positive feedback loops. Okay. When you increase interconnections and you strengthen them, you create lots of opportunities for positive feedback in the system where you get self-reinforcing mechanisms where change creates more change and things happen very quickly because of that. And what happens as a result of this is that things tend to get driven to extremes. For example, if you look at the recent economic crisis, in the year 2000, uh, there were roughly $60 trillion in over-the-counter derivatives. By 2007, there were 60, $600 trillion in over-the-counter derivatives, and it was the over-the-counter derivatives that played a role in the economic crisis. That kind of growth could never have happened without the information interconnections and all the positive feedback loops that occur. So that in the future, we are going to see a lot more things. We're going to see uh, a lot more winner-take-all situations where companies such as uh, Google emerge. And I think that one of the things we have to do as a country is figure out how to take advantage of all the positive feedback loops that are going to exist to create economic advantage and opportunities in our country. What do you see as some of the mechanisms by which um, institutions, organizations can uh, grapple with, shape, or take advantage of these positive feedback dynamics? Well, I, I, I think what they, they ought to realize they're living in that world <laughs> And, and then figure out how to structure themselves to take advantage of the fact that, uh, that just from a competitive point of view, that if they don't move to these new, more efficient infrastructures, a competitor will. So that in a sense, uh, I think that uh, we should take advantage of it as a sort of as a first mover advantage in this country. I mean, that's how a Google emerged, uh, that's how a Facebook emerged, uh, things like this. And I think we ought to take advantage of the fact that all industry around the world is going to be restructured in some way because of this type of interconnectivity. Is it your view that this is a trend that um has in a way only just begun, that we're going to look forward to even greater magnitudes of changes in the, in the immediate future than we've experienced to date? I, I don't know whether, I mean, it, it changes proceeding so quickly now. I think the main challenge is to figure out how to take advantage of even the technologies we've got today <laughs> to do uh, these great, great things. Do you feel that that might be one of the challenges of, of living um, with this kind of Moore's Law dynamic, which is that uh, that pace of change is occurring uh, so quickly that we aren't really, uh, we don't have the time, uh, the space to kind of optimize our adaption to the change, that it's already moving along so quickly before we really can make best use of kind of what we have at a particular moment. Well, I, I think we're going to end up with a different physical infrastructure, a different economic infrastructure, and a different social infrastructure. And I think in the 1930s, there was a sociologist named William Ogburn who um, uh, 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 coined a term called cultural lag. And what he pointed out was that when two forces in society get out of step, 
it creates a tremendous amount of tension and, and friction and that this caused a lot of social problems. And the challenge now is to figure out how to adapt our in institutions to a completely new environment. And um, it, the new environment is going to exist. The challenge is figuring out how to train a, a, a labor force to adapt or how to transform a General Motors to adapt. Uh, I was seeing the other day that the millennials are not buying cars very much. I mean, the, the number of cars bought by millennials, I think, is down by 30 or 40 percent. And what they're spending their money on is, uh, is electronic devices because that's the way they travel, that's the way they interact with people and things like that. And I think we've got to try to figure out how to create a society that uh, is, uh, is going to operate in that environment. Do you see any particular um, spaces or contexts where that sort of dialogue is going on about um, shifting institutions? I think one of the problems is that our leadership is still very much got their mind uh, in the 20th century. And uh, th they are not thinking about what new forms of connectivity m mean. And you know, my favorite example of this was when the Winter Olympics uh, occurred in Salt Lake City. And here it was the hub of networking uh, in, the, in the world, and so you would have thought, gee, these people are, 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 are really with it. And what did they do? They built more roads to get people <laughs> to, the, to the thing. So the question is, what does infrastructure look like in the 21st century? Uh, is it that we build more fiber optic networks, or do we try to build more highways? Mm -hmm. What does the role of public transportation look like when we clearly don't need to travel as much to experience things. And I think that we've got to think about these new infrastructures and say, what is the infrastructure of the future based on information technology we have? Because uh, clearly a, uh, an infrastructure of the future that depended on us being everywhere physically uh, is, is not going to be uh, the infrastructure that we should be building. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, to the extent that you're comfortable doing it, to um, you know think forward about um, this kind of Moore's Law dynamic, if you will, and um, maybe not asking you to prognosticate <laughs> how long you think that this dynamic might continue, but uh, what you think may be the consequences of a shift in what we've become accustomed to in, um, for the past 50 years, a slowing, a change of the equation from better equals cheaper to better equals more expensive. Um, just if you had any reflections on well, I, that I, area. I, I guess I was, I was talking to an economist actually this morning, and I was saying that I think our definition of quality of life is going to change. And um, it, 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 lots of things that add to quality of life today have become cheaper and if we measure these totally in economic terms, we're going to conclude that our standard of living is going down. But if we also look at it and say, gee, I don't have to travel as much, and um, uh, my entertainment is essentially free, and I don't have to go out to the theater as much because these things come to me, um, we've got to figure out what quality of life means in the 21st century. Hmm. And I think our quality of life could well be increasing dramatically while our incomes are going down. And we might have a lot of economists saying, oh, things are horrible when people are happier. So <laughs> uh, I think those are the kinds of issues we've got to think about. Well, perhaps we could, um, Carver, we could turn to you at this point to ask you, um, you know, you've been uh, so involved with this progression of um, Moore's Law in silicon microchips. Um, just to, if you could reflect on the, the extent to which um, human imagination, human inventiveness, creative energy has been kind of channeled in this, into this project across a diverse technical communities, if you could perhaps reflect on that for us. 
Well, there, there's some obvious comments, but maybe worth making anyway. Um, early on, it was very interesting because uh, Gordon had made this compelling case for the economics of increasing integration. And uh, one morning, I was doing my weekly chat with with Gordon early in the morning, and uh, he said this would be in the early 60s. And uh, he said, well, you're working on electron tunneling. That, that happens when things get very small. Yeah. But that, isn't that going to limit how small a transistor can get? And I said, well, it certainly will. And he said, well, how small is that? And I said, well, you know, we've been doing tunneling on films as thin as a few tens of angstroms. So when your gate oxides start being a few tens of angstroms, then it gets iffy. And we can't just keep doing things the way we've been doing it. But that's a long way from now. That's a couple of orders of magnitude. And, uh, but I said, that's, I'll go away and think about that more quantitatively. So that led to work with a, with a student by the name of Bruce Honeisen, who's a great guy. And um, we concluded there was two orders of magnitude in linear dimension, four orders of magnitude in aerial density, and that doesn't count the increase in the size of the chip. Well, that's a lot already. <laughs> so, um, and people thought we were nuts, hmm. absolutely nuts. There were all kinds of papers proving that we were right on the edge of fundamental limits, the thing Gordon was talking about. So one of the issues I had to take on was convincing people that we weren't going to violate any of the laws of physics in getting another five or six orders of magnitude. And it was a tough sell. <laughs> it's a really tough sell. People were just absolutely sure there was an edge of the world right there we were about to go off of. That's an old belief system, of course. <laughs> uh, and it, I noticed that there's a little trepidation when Bill talks about the future, like, well, maybe there's the edge of the world right there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't look at it that way. Um, I spent a lot of time convincing people it was physically doable because, it, you know, you've commented and a lot of people know it. And Moore's law is not a law of physics. Moore's law is a reflection on human nature. And there are two things important about it. People have to know down deep that something's possible, that it's physically possible to achieve. And they also have to believe deeply that it's worth doing. Mm -hmm. And it requires both of those things. And so Gordon was working on one end. I was working on the other end. <laughs> and uh, that was how we, we collaborated for many years. And, um, and that's still true, that people have to believe that it's possible to achieve certain things, some of the things Bill was talking about. And they have to believe it's a positive thing to do, that it's going to make the world a better place. And it's incumbent on all of us to look forward and realize that this new world we're thinking about actually creates a whole lot more freedom of the human spirit than the world we used to live in. Um, it also creates dislocations, and there's lots of challenges that go with it, but one of the things that has amazed me is just uh, observing what's happened with the rate of change that we've had. You know, it's completely changed our lives, all of us. And it hasn't really bothered us. <laughs> I'm enjoying it, I don't know about you. But, uh, it makes everything I do better. 
And the other thing I've noticed living with that process down through life is that the, the things you worry about and the things you believe are the problems to solve. You get so focused on it that then all of a sudden over here somewhere there's something that changes that makes that not the problem anymore. Hmm. Uh, obvious example was when we, in the good old days back in the 50s, we were all working to make the transistors better. And then by Bob Noyce comes along and says, why don't we just use the metal that's there to hook up the transistors that are there? Well, duh. <laughs> yeah. But we didn't see it. And in fact, for the next 20 years, we had a hard time convincing people, including a bunch of you guys at Intel, <laughs> that the problem was the wiring, not the transistors. Because everybody was so used to thinking of the transistors as a scarce resource. They didn't realize that all the resources were going into hooking them up, not to making the transistors themselves. So we're fighting last year's war. And if you think about it seriously, that always happens because the tools we have for thinking and the language we use and the similes and parables we use to express the human situation. They all come from history. They come from what's before, not what's going forward. So there's a lot of fighting last year's war. It's particularly evident in public policy. <laughs> I don't have to explain, obviously. Um, because that's that's the only terms in which we have to express problems and issues and challenges and opportunities. Most of the opportunities come from directions we don't expect. So just about the time we're pursuing an opportunity that is obvious, there's one over here that's totally non-obvious that has a much bigger effect on the future. I'd like to ask uh, the both of you to, re to reflect on something that, um, that I've been observing in my historical work. I've been spending, what I, I like to tell people, I've been spending a lot of time in the 1950s, <laughs> uh, just with what I'm reading, reading the technical literature, really looking into the early history of microcircuitry. And in that decade, before the kind of rise of the silicon microchip and this dynamic that we've been living with for so long, you could characterize that era um, in many ways as a period of technological uncertainty. It wasn't certain in just which, from a kind of component point of view, which direction the technology Absolutely. would be going. Um, people were looking at superconducting electronics. They were looking at all sorts of hybrid microcircuitry, there are a, a variety, all magnetic circuitry. Uh, and the thermionic integrated micromodule, <laughs> which was the miniaturized vacuum tube. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, these kind of field emission, yeah. tunneling vacuum Absolutely. devices, a lot of diversity. Yeah. And as I read um, things, um, as I read in the technological community today, certainly around um, silicon electronics, its future, I see um, my sense is that there's a growing uncertainty in that community about just where things are headed. So um, one, I'd like to know if, if, you f if both of you, if you feel that it's true that we're entering into kind of a more there's more uncertainty in the technological community today that about s silicon electronics than there has been perhaps in the past. A, is that, does that comport with your experience? And um, B, might it be a good thing, a kind of return to how it normally is to be more uncertain about 
what direction technology will head. And perhaps we can start with you, Bill. I think that's a Carver question. <laughs> Carver. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's one of the negative consequences of our finding that if we just scale the transistor, we could go for three or four orders of magnitude. Um, was that people stopped thinking about device physics. I mean, the, the learning curve for process technology was fantastic, but people completely stopped thinking about device physics because we had the transistors and if you made them smaller, you beat everybody. <laughs> so basically, it, it, the market for people who really did deep thought about device physics went away. Well, now we're having to rebuild that. And one of the things I, I noticed uh, down through the years, uh, in, in our education system, just about the time that some old lore that has been part of curricula for years goes out of style and you get rid of it just the time you need it again. We, we experienced it when we were doing MOS circuits and, and we did a lot of MOS switching circuits. And uh, it was just like relay logic. Well, it turns out nobody had any relay logic in their courses anymore because obviously nobody used relays. Hmm. But the MOS devices worked the same way. So, and, and this goes on and on and on, and uh, there's modern examples of this. And I think what you're talking about is a modern example where we've, we've weeded out all of the courses and all of the, the, uh, the uh, job opportunities and the incentives for people who really thought deeply about device physics. Now we're gonna need those people. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to go through the whole thing again, but this is just part of the process, it's part of the cycle. We've been through these cycles many times, and uh, people will rise to the occasion, and, and maybe it's a good, good thing to get to the point where we get to rethink it from scratch again. Hmm. Go back and look at the old ideas, look at the new ideas, compare everything, uh, instead of just grinding ahead. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I uh, picked up in your comments, Carver, and um, Bill, in reading your writings is, um, Carver, you were talking about kind of the, the human spirit, uh, the lived experience. Um, Bill, you've written about this in, in your work about um, the connection between sort of psychological or lived experience import of the kind of changes made possible by the Moore's Law dynamic. I wonder if um, perhaps you could speak to your thoughts on that. I don't know as I'm going to answer <laughs> your question directly, but uh, I've been reading a lot about consciousness and the mind, and I've been really w wondering about what the mind looks like and what our senses look like in the virtual world. And, uh, you know, I was astounded to uh, learn something that I had never thought about, and I'm sure that maybe some of you haven't thought about that colors do not exist. Uh, and colors, all that we sense is energy levels. And our mind creates colors. And music does not exist. All we hear is different vibrations, and our mind creates music. And I've been wondering, and I have no answers about this, uh, how all of these things that were created in the physical world map over into virtual worlds and uh, what the virtual mind looks like. Mm. And I don't know whether this is addressing your, <laughs> your question, <laughs> but it's something that I've mused about a lot because uh, I, I think it's going to be uh, fascinating to try and understand the function of the mind in the virtual environment. Mm. Carver, do you have any thoughts in this direction about the 
the lived experience in the electronic world? Well, no, I don't, but uh, um, I can comment on the mind issue because there's a lot of noise out there about how we've got so much computing now, we're going to be able to build brains and they're going to be intelligent. And, and um, one of the things that's happened, uh, you know, I spent 15 years of my life working on neurobiology and trying to understand that stuff. And uh, just since I've been doing that, and following that a little bit, one of the things we've noticed in, is in the history of understanding the mind, first, um, the, the first lore I was aware of, the, the mind was a clockwork. And that was in uh, the, the late Middle Ages when clocks were the highest technology anybody knew. Hmm. And then, you know, we got into a little later on and the, the mind became a telephone switching network mm -hmm. because that was the fanciest technology we knew. And then, of course, all of you have witnessed uh, the, all of the discussions about the mind being a digital computer. And with it, every time, people would look at what we could see in the brain, you know, and they would look at the cells and they'd count the cells and they'd say, oh, the cell is a switch or the cell is a transistor or something. Well, then we, by we, I mean the people who do neurobiology, got sharper tools and we started to understand what was going on there better and we found out that it wasn't a neuron that was a, transistor, the, the neurons had thousands of synapses on them. Well, maybe the synapse was a transistor. <laughs> so then people counted differently. Well, we were only off a factor of a few thousand. What's that in Moore's Law, you know? <laughs> well, then people started understanding just in the last decade what goes on inside a synapse. It turns out there's whole chemical networks inside every synapse. So there's thousands of state variables in the synapse. <laughs> and every one of them is a complex network. Okay, <laughs> we still have a lot to learn about the brain. <laughs> Don't count it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps to shift Attack entirely. Um, you know, um, at times, uh, Gordon Moore has said, really, his writings about Moore's Law was that it's all about economics, really, what he was getting at. Um, that uh, his observation of these fundamental dynamics were um, just as much about economics of a competitive industry as they were about uh, kind of the extensibility of silicon technology. Um, and with this dynamic that's been playing for 50 years, um, it seems almost that the exponential changes in it, um, well, for one, it's been a tremendous um, deflationary force in the world, Moore's Law, and um, also from a perspective of the productivity of the semiconductor industry measured by you know, widgets per employee. If the widgets are silicon transistors, the productivity is kind of off scale. So too would be its deflationary effect. I wonder if just you had um, any reflections on how you see the place of this uh, silicon electronics and computing dynamic within kind of macroeconomics generally. If you had any thoughts about that and where we may be heading with it. Bill, uh, to well, I, I, I've thought a lot about <laughs> I've thought a lot about deflation because uh, uh, you know one of my problems is that economists measure inflation and deflation in 20th century terms hmm. and or 18th or 17th <laughs> and and so if if my income stays the same 
and the cost of the things I need to buy drops in half, uh, then my standard of living goes up. But the economists, and if the cost of what I buy drops in half and my salary drops by 10 percent, my standard of living still goes up. And the economists conclude that that's deflationary. And I, I realize that this is not a simple question, but I think that all of the rules we've lived by change significantly. And uh, it, the, the, the problem is that, that we keep applying old metrics to these new environments. And I, 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 it's not that the old metrics are totally wrong, but I don't think they reflect what accurately is going on. And so we're using old metrics to, to direct economic decisions. And I think we're probably going to make a lot of bad economic decisions because the metrics are out of date. Hmm. Carver, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's an understatement of the uh, issue. <laughs> uh, by the way, George Gilder had just recently written a very nice book on this topic called Knowledge and Power. Uh, most of our economic discussions, let alone theory, um, don't account for innovation. Hmm. It isn't one of the things that goes on in those models. It's nuts. That's most of what goes on economically is innovation, and it's left out of economic models. So, so anyway, George discusses that in this book, and, and uh, it needs to get front and center in all discussions of economics, and uh, otherwise you just leave out the leading term in what economics is all about. Hmm. And as you, as you look at um, opportunities for um, inventive work uh, going ahead, both in um, an entrepreneurial context, in a kind of um, social entrepreneurial mode in terms of uh, technological innovations as you, as we look ahead to the kind of the next iterations of uh, development in silicon electronics and computing, um, we see, um, you know, billion, per, you know, perhaps another billion people coming <laughs> online uh, in the next five years. Uh, what, as you both look ahead, what areas do you look um, most uh, intriguing, most in need of attention, um, given the change that we can expect, expect in our immediate future. Uh, what uh, excites you looking ahead, and what um, concerns you? Well, I, I happened to read a book that was published in 1921. It was a play <laughs> called uh, Rossum's Universal Robots. <laughs> and I don't know how many of you have read that, but that's um, uh, where the term robotics came from. And uh, it, it, I don't know whether it was the English translation or not, but uh, I suddenly felt like I was reading about the 21st century when I was reading the, the book. And, uh, you, you know, robots were doing everything, and uh, the birth rate of the population had dropped. And uh, people were worrying about what their purpose in life was because they didn't have work. And I think that one of the really interesting things is, is that what will we use to uh, define our identities in the future? Because uh, I also was looking at something the other day, and it wasn't too long ago that we were working 60 hours a week. And now the work week is 40 hours, and we know that you can't work 30 hours a week because in France we can point to the fact that if you work 32 hours a week or whatever it is, um, you can't be competitive. And I begin to scratch my head and say, you know, well, is all of that true? And I think the kinds of issues we've got to think about is if the tools become so good that we really don't have to work 40 hours a week. How am I going to define 
my personal identity. And I find that I'm fortunate that I don't have to work 40 hours a week anymore. And I'm busier than I've ever been. And I'm enjoying life tremendously. And so that, that I think that our whole mentality about the way we live is probably going to change as a result of, of Moore's Law. Now, I don't know whether that addresses your question. It does. <laughs> That reminds me of discussions that used to go on in the 50s about how the biggest problem we had is what are we going to do with all everyone's spare time, all this free time, that because the productivity was going up so much. A terrible social problem. There were huge discussions in the 50s. What about your sophomore classes? <laughs> yeah, well, there's a, there was that, too. Was, uh, the, the whole notion of of economics in a um, changing, when there are fundamental changes in the age of things, uh, is, as we've noted, it, it, it isn't expressible in the terms of the old economics. It's just simply not. Um, to me, the, the most exciting thing you remember one of the great changes in the nature of, of human consciousness as a group was the invention of printing so that more people had access to information. And the next step along that was um, broadcast. We had first radio and then television broadcast and a huge, huge amount more access to information, real-time information. But the, to me, the absolutely essential change that's happened recently is we've gone from a broadcast mentality to a point-to-point -point connection mentality. Hmm. So we went from order n to order n squared which is an enormous increase. And it's amazed me how people go out of their way to try to turn it back into a broadcast mentality. <laughs> <laughs> and for example, you, you know, the big successes that we've seen. eBay is a great example of a point-to-point -point thing. And the value there is the number of sellers times the number of buyers. So it's an n squared thing. But if you look at most of what goes on in the network, it's still a broadcast mentality. You want a small number of sources to go to a big number of, so that's just slightly enlarged broadcast. Thank you. And we haven't begun to see the real gain that we get by having the thing become a point-to-point, n-squared -point kind of thing. So I think what we should be thinking about, this is enlarging the dimensionality. And I think what's really going on from here forward is the big opportunities are enlarging the dimensionality. Mm -hmm. And we should be thinking about it that way. Now, same thing true for economics. Well, before we turn to entertaining some questions from our friends in the audience, I just thought I would um, see if uh, you wanted to respond to, um, you know, in reflecting on this kind of 50-year trajectory of Moore's Law, if there are any um, kind of central uh, lessons that you've uh, taken from your reflection on that experience that you'd like to share, anything that you'd like to say about this um, development of silicon electronics and computing that we, we haven't yet touched on, um, something that I've missed in my questions, so to speak. Um, Bill, do you have any? Well, I, I just think that what I've become conscious of is how quickly uh, what you used to do has become obsolete, hmm. and the excitement of then finding new things to do and, and, and new adventures. And so that 
I become conscious of the fact that you have to become less tethered to the past and enjoy uh, the exploration of the future. And I think that that's a challenge for people personally, but it's also a challenge for, for businesses especially. And the, the way I see businesses get in trouble today is that they are trying to preserve the algorithms of the past <laughs> and whether it's the recording industry or the publishing industry or things like that, and they haven't then gone ahead and figured out what they should be in the future. Carver, something we've missed in our discussion to this moment. I, I, I guess the, it's obvious, but we spent 50 years building a platform hmm. in the same way that the publishing industry built a, a broadcast platform and the radio and television industry built platforms. Those were broadcast platforms. We've spent the last 50 years building a platform of computation and communication and so forth. Now there's a platform. <laughs> And what people make success out of is finding the part that's missing mm. and solving that. Well, the platform's there. It gets improved and all that. But people are finding out new and innovative ways of mobilizing the platform to do all kinds of things. And some of those are filling urgent felt need that we didn't even, we weren't aware of was so <laughs> urgently felt. And uh, so looking forward, um, look for the things that are the pinch points, the things that are preventing us from going forward in certain areas. And finding ways to get through the pinch points are what creates value makes the world a better place, and that's not going to change. Hmm. Well, let's turn to a few, I think we have time for a few questions from uh, the audience. The first is, um, are there any other areas in which Moore's Law applies? Medicine, social justice, I guess, if only that were the case, um, or, or is it unique to silicon electronics? Any thoughts on um, other areas of exponential change? Absolutely. Uh, we, um, we should have said that, in fact, uh, uh, the exponential increase in capability has happened in magnetic recording. It's happened in uh, uh, the uh, optical communications. It's happened in old-fashioned radio communications. Uh, Wherever there's been an urgent need and smart people and the physics doesn't prevent it, we've had these exponentials still going on. And in fact, when we talk about uh, the platform that I described, it's really the exponentials in all of these together that have brought about the world. And silicon electronics is an absolutely essential part of that, but it's by no means all of it. And in fact, uh, these other technologies have played an equally important role. Bill, any thoughts on well, that? Well, I, 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 the one which it's not clear to me whether it's Moore's Law or not, but I would <laughs> say the exponential growth in knowledge is another thing that has been happening. And if you look at all of this change, it's, it's driven by people learning more, understanding more, being able to discover more. And, uh, you know, as Steve Coonan, who was the provost at Caltech, used to say, everything is happening at the edges. And suddenly you have this tool that enables you to find out, you know, I'm interested in that technology and I'm interested in this technology and trying to figure out how they're going to interact. And so the rate of progress from knowledge, and it, it's based on the Moore's Law platform, but it's, it's the access to all of this stuff, which is, um, uh, creating uh, very rapid growth. Hmm. Um, Bill, I think this might be directed toward you initially. Um, what will be the future of the semiconductor industry 
if venture capitalists don't invest in it anymore? Any thoughts about that challenge? <laughs> well, I, 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 I think you, you do lose areas of innovation and you, you, know, you, you look at some of these creative niches and uh, um, you know, it was, um, if you look at Qualcomm, I, 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 Intel could have done that and Samsung could have done that, but it was a creative group over there that, that figured out um, uh, new ways to do, you know, cellular communications. And I think you'll, you'll lose some of that. And uh, I, I don't know what you do about that, and, uh, but I hope that people will still keep in investing in some of these new applications. Carver, any thoughts on that question? Um, this one might be for um, the both of you. Um, what, in looking at fields like quantum computing and nanotechnology, um, have, you, have you thought about uh, connections of, of those two fields to um, the future of electronics development? Uh, do you see, do you follow those areas closely? Right now, um, those areas have, of course, some very practical outworking, especially the nanotechnology stuff is highly directly related to our electronics world. Uh, the quantum stuff, what it's really giving us up to this point is a very much closer hands-on appreciation for quantum phenomena. When quantum mechanics was crafted back in the 1920s, um, it was done against a backdrop of, of some atomic spectral lines. And we really didn't have any examples of hands-on quantum systems that we could work on. And now we have a lot of those examples and uh, the, the quantum computing paradigm has become sort of a framework within which we can start trying to redo the hodgepodge of stuff that was kludged together in the 1920s and get a more understandable quantum um, comprehension. The new synthesis of that field has not happened yet, but there's a whole bunch of us who are uh, dissatisfied with the uh, legacy and we need to do that over again. Bill, any thoughts on those subjects? No, I think, subjects? I think Carver did okay. just fine. Great, well then, perhaps uh, in the interest of time, um, Carver, one one question pointed uh, directly toward you is, um, what do you make of the accusation that you were the one who coined the phrase Moore's Law? Do you recall doing that? Uh, that was a, a funny story. I was, it was during a period where I was trying to convince people that it was physically possible to make devices that small, which, is, uh, as I mentioned, was a tough sell. And after one of those sessions, it was in the... It was in the early 60s, something. And one of those sessions, um, some reporter came up afterwards. And we went off and, I think we went off and had dinner and talked about the whole thing. And, uh, and then a day or two later, their story came out in one of the technical magazines. And for the life of me, I have not been able to find that. But it used the term Moore's Law. Hmm. So it came out over dinner, probably a couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was, that was my memory of how that happened. Too. Well, on that note, perhaps you could all join me in thanking Carver and Bill, and also the uh, Computer History Museum and the Chemical Heritage Foundation uh, for this lovely day. So thank you both yeah. very, very much. And thanks to you all. <laughs>